I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. The Legend of Slippery Skin, the Monster of New England The great storyteller, Kenneth Lewis Roberts' novel, Northwest Passage, has the earliest known evidence of a Bigfoot-like creature living in New England, one of the best historical fiction works ever produced. In the novel, a scout for Major Robert Rogers and his illustrious group of rangers recalls a startling black bear sighting during the French and Indian War in 1759. The Bigfoot-like creature was originally mentioned in writing about this encounter in what is now the state of Vermont. While the group was camped in northern Vermont, close to the Missisqua Bay, the area of the lake that protrudes six miles into Canada, the bear reportedly threw pine cones and nuts at them from a distance. The rangers sailed from their camp at Crown Point up to the northern edge of Lake Champlain on the Canadian side of the lake, according to a scout by the name of Duluth. In retaliation for an earlier attack on a squad of British soldiers, they raided an Abenaki Indian camp at St. Francis in what is now Quebec province. According to Duluth, the rangers met the bear as they were fleeing while being followed by a group of Indians and French soldiers. According to Duluth, his raiding party was always being irritated for no cause by a gigantic black bear who would toss large pine cones and nuts down upon us from trees and ledges, in his own words. He claimed that the harassing behavior of the monster had left the Native Americans disgusted, adding that they know him and call him Weejuk or Wetskine. The early inhabitants of northern Vermont heard legends of a Bigfoot-like creature known as Slippery Skin in the latter half of the 18th century. The name is suspiciously close to the Indian name of Wetskine that Rogers' rangers are said to have encountered and is present in several oral and recorded traditions throughout the state. It would seem that descriptions of a similar creature in the area around the same time were not a coincidence. The term was given because of the animal's extraordinary capacity to avoid hunters. There are numerous accounts of Old Slippery Skin, a creature that was supposed to resemble a big bear, in early Vermont historical sources. It did, however, usually walk or run standing on two legs, unlike any known bear. Numerous villages in northeastern Vermont have histories that are filled with slippery skin encounters. Many accounts have undoubtedly been inflated, but even if some of them are accurate, it would be impossible to accept that the creature was a typical bear. Numerous references to this Bigfoot-like creature have been found in what is now Vermont, according to historian Paul Reno. According to Reno, during the last half of the 18th century, this odd creature was rumored to chase sheep and cows as well as throw stones at hunters and schoolchildren. The animal was accused of stealing meat from smokehouses, toppling haystacks, putting rocks in sap buckets, and inserting wire into lawnmowers and hay rakes, among other misdemeanors. Occasionally, big rocks would be found in or on farm equipment, shocking farmers. Of course, it's also plausible that some of these instances were caused by insurgent Native Americans, displeased neighbors, mischievous children, or even scorned lovers. The towns of Lemington, Victory, and Maidstone in Essex County were devastated by the beast. It was blamed for destroying gardens, toppling manure mounds, and tearing down fences in Lemington, leaving a trail of enormous footprints in the mud and snow. Wetskin was described as moving in a ghostly manner and as dissipating as silently and quickly into the woods as a drift of smoke. Similar reports have come from Victory and Maidstone, two nearby cities. This bear was held accountable in Victory for causing livestock to stampede and destroying cornfields by dragging branches through them. It was supposed to be particularly skilled at diverting hunters' attention. The animal would back right back into the tracks of his forward movement with such accuracy and precision that no one who did not suspect the trick would see any signs of a reverse movement until the bear came to some large rock or knoll then gave a long leap onto a bare spot and move off in a direction diverging from that just pursued, according to one account. Former Vermont Governor Jonas Galusha, a well-known hunter, is said to have had a legendary encounter with Slippery Skin. Galusha held the top position in the state for two times from 1809 to 1813 and then again from 1815 to 1820. Galusha pledged during one of his re-election campaigns to personally shoot Slippery Skin in order to purge the state of the monster. 
He led a hunting team and arrived in the settlement within a few days of it being discovered in Maidstone, maybe as a PR stunt to help his flagging campaign. He is claimed to have retrieved a vial of female bear smell just before the hunt began and applied it to his clothing in an effort to entice Slippery Skin out of the woods. He failed, as did his bid for re-election. In order to bring the animal inside, another group of hunters departed the Orleans County community of Morgan. They could hear a tremendous pounding sound coming from above as they traveled down a logging road that led to the summit of Elon Mountain. This was the same sound that the local Native Americans had attributed to the stone giants. The men hastily buried themselves in the bushes close by in preparation for an ambush on Slippery Skin. They said that the cunning animal backtracked on its prints before rolling a massive tree down the slope and nearly missed the hunters as they were laying in wait. They returned home terrified and perplexed. They immediately stopped pursuing and the search was stopped. It's impossible to determine how much of the tale and exaggeration is accurate. What is undeniable is that many of the state's early inhabitants claimed to have seen a big, Bigfoot-like monster with unbear-like characteristics, such as walking on two legs and human-like intelligence. The fact that several hunters throughout the time allegedly fired shots at the creature without killing it may seem unbelievable. Michael Pluta, a Vermont historian, points out that there could be a rational explanation for why all of the gunfire failed to kill Bigfoot. Rifles from that time and place were typically light in caliber, or had modest muzzle velocities. On heavy game, penetration would likely be shallow. The only people who would have spent money on a bigger weapon were those who routinely killed moose and bear. There were multiple reports of an ape-man in August 1861 near Bennington, Vermont, and just across the border in North Adams, Massachusetts. A reporter for a newspaper claimed that Vermonters called the creature hideous, The man-beast was shot at by a number of individuals, but it always managed to flee into the woods. As is so common with Bigfoot claims, there were speculations that it was a prankster prowling the countryside while dressed as a gorilla. But why would someone sprint through the forest while wearing a gorilla suit, repeatedly, no less, knowing that hunting teams were close behind them, and continuing to do so even after bullets had been fired? October 17, 1879, Pownall, Vermont The report that two young men saw a wild man last Friday while hunting on the hills south of Williamstown caused great excitement among the local hunters. The young men described the monster as being around five feet tall, looking and moving like a man, but covered with brilliant red hair all over, sporting a long, straggly beard and possessing extremely crazy eyes. When first spotted, the creature jumped out from behind a rocky cliff and headed for some nearby woods. One of the men shot at it, thinking it was a bear or another wild animal, and it is believed to have been wounded, because with fierce cries of pain and rage, it turned on its assailants. They fled with their weapons and ammo, but did not look around for fear of running into the odd monster. In the northwest of the state, close to Litchfield Hills, in Litchfield County, Connecticut, there had been a number of reports of wild men. In Winstead, the epidemic started in August 1895. As the media flocked to the area, the sightings created a sensation across New England. Local selectman Riley Smith claimed to have seen the monster on a muggy summer day, which is when the story originated. Smith claimed to have stopped on August 17th along the old Colbrick Highway at Old Low Sal Road, five miles outside of Winstead, in a place called Indian Meadow or Injun Meadow, to gather blackberries. According to him, the monster appeared in the center of the berry patch, Its nude body was covered in hair. It possessed hands that were considerably larger than average, a head that was larger than a person, and sharp teeth the size of a horse's. He claimed that when the thing showed there, his bulldog Ned started to howl and sought sanctuary under a wagon behind a mound of blankets with its tail between its legs. According to Smith, the man-beast let out frightened sounds after emerging from the bushes before scurrying into the woods and vanishing from view. He claimed it had long black hair that was cascading back from its head as it rushed away. Smith, who was well-liked and respected for his physical prowess in the area, admitted to being terrified after the encounter to the Winstead Herald on August 21st. The Winstead's evening citizen's assertion that Mr. Riley had a good reputation on August 27th simply served to support the allegations. Mr. Riley Smith is a man that says very little. 
He is a man of undeniable pluck and nerve, and his word is first class, it said. The reports of sightings led to a fear that resulted in 500 individuals joining various search groups that were organized to look for the monster. John G. Hall, who ran a stagecoach between Winstead and Sandisfield, Massachusetts, led another party of eyewitnesses. A big beast crossed the road and leaped over a stone wall as the bus traveled through Colebrook, Connecticut. Hall claimed that the animal was standing straight ahead on the roadway as the carriage neared it. The horses were stopped by Hall after he took out a handgun. It sprinted off on all fours toward Indian Meadow as he raised his gun. Also claiming to see the monster in Indian Meadow were two New York City residents who were spending the summer in Colebrook. The creature, according to Miss Sadie Woodhouse and Mrs. Michonne, was six and a half feet tall, had black hair, white teeth, and a very strong build. It also stood erect. The creature was believed to be an escaped zoo gorilla at the time, despite the fact that no such animal had ever been reported missing, and no remains had ever been discovered. The previous winter, a similar creature had been spotted in the adjacent Connecticut town of Norfolk. A farmer in Sandisfield claimed to have seen the monster take one of his rabbits, while Mrs. George Marvin of South Norfolk claimed to have seen it steal one of her hens one morning. Carl Moore and Joe Bruley, two other local men, claimed they fired birdshot at the thing, but it had no impact. Charles Benson, a resident of Norfolk, said that the creature chased him inside his home after leaping out of a tree. The gorilla-like monster was seen by numerous persons in Norfolk the previous spring when it entered a hole in the mountainside. According to reports, they allegedly hung thick chains over the hole to keep it from moving. The shackles were apparently broken the next morning. Police in Haverville, Massachusetts, searched in vain for a strange wild man who locals had reported seeing in the early days of July 1909 in a forested area close to Guile Street. There were several reports of a wild man during World War II in the area of Pontesac Lake, which is located in western Massachusetts and is just east of Pittsfield State Forest. When Pittsfield resident Willis L. Brazy was detained by Massachusetts State Police on November 18, 1942, the mystery appeared to have been solved. He was an Army private who had been observed missing from Camp Edwards in Falmouth without authorization. Thanks for listening. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.